Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? Good to see all of you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So a couple years ago for spring break, our family decided to do a staycation here in the Milwaukee area. Instead of going away or getting out of town, we just stayed put. And part of that staycation was a few nights at a cottage about an hour north of the city uh, near Lake Michigan. And we went up that way on a Wednesday, stayed through Saturday morning. And we had a decent time while we were there the whole time. And the, the reason why I say a decent time is because the three and a half days we were there, it did nothing but rain. Rain, rain, rain. And when it's March and it's rainy, you can't really get out and do a whole lot. So we just kind of hunkered down in this cottage, made the best of it, had a good time. So Saturday morning rolls around, and it's time for us to pack up, head home. And the, the, the cottage didn't have a garage. It had like this parking pad, that was a gravel parking pad. And in between the cottage and the parking pad, they just had like grass. It was just grass. And so the van is parked in the parking pad. Um, being dad, I have to do all the loading of the van. And so everybody packs up. And I'm needing to carry all of the stuff in the cottage to the van. And the grass is just soggy and soaked from all the rain we got. Now, where the grass met that parking pad, there was a little shallow ditch of about like five inches or so. But again, because of all the rain, it had filled up. And there, the width of this was probably like four or five feet. So the first time I go out there, I've got a load of stuff. And I realize there's this ditch. And I kind of like figure out, can I can I just step over it and make it? Or what am I going to have to do? And I realized, like, I'm going to have to jump each time with whatever load of stuff I had. So instead of doing that and risking falling and risking spilling all this stuff, I had this idea. Hey, what if I back my van so that it kind of straddles the ditch? And that way, see, somebody's like, yeah, that's not a bad idea. I thought the same thing straddle the ditch so that the end of the van is at the edge of the ditch, and all I have to do is navigate soggy grass, not that big a deal, and not have to worry about jumping a ditch each time. So I do that. I load up the van, close the back hatch. I maneuver around the ditch one more time. I get into the driver's seat. I start up the van. It starts. I go to push the gas, and nothing happens. We don't move. And I can hear the front tires spinning like crazy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm stuffed. And so I, I get out of the van to like see what I'm dealing with. And this is what I see. Our van has like sunk into the mud by like a solid three inches. The whole bottom half of the tire is in the mud. We can even zoom in a little bit closer. And I'm like, what in the world am I going to do? Now, if you've ever been stuck in snow, there's this strategy to get your car unstuck in the snow by rocking the car, right? You put it in reverse, you back up just a little bit, you put it in drive, you move forward just a little bit, you put it in reverse, you back, and hopefully the momentum of that swing propels you out of the ditch. So I do that, I'm like, this is gonna work. Like I've done this before in snow, this will be no problem. And I go to put it in reverse, nothing. Go to put it in drive, nothing. Go to put it in reverse, no like the car is stuck beyond belief. And I'm like, we are just stuck. And I'm frustrated, it's cold, it's rainy, I'm just ready to be home, be in our house. And so fortunately, though, our car insurance has roadside assistance. So I'm like, I can get a tow, no problem. I walk back to the cottage, I'm frustrated, but thinking, what's the worst that's going to happen? We're going to hang here for another hour as we wait for a tow truck, and then we'll be on our way. So it's an automated system, right? So I call in, I say where I'm at, I say what's going on, and they're asking me questions, are you safe, all this. And I'm waiting on hold, and it's playing that music, and then all of a sudden a voice comes on, still automated, and it says, due to the lack of drivers in your area, the next available tow will be, and then it pauses, Monday at 9 a.m. <laughs> like, Monday at 9 a.m., like, I have to get to church by tomorrow. I've got to work. Not, I'm just supposed to hang here for two days, stuck, and wait for a tow truck driver? I mean... In that moment, I knew that I needed help, and there was no help to be found. I was powerless to do anything to get our family home 
And all I needed was someone to help me, and there was no help at all. And I wonder if you've ever been there before. Like, it's clear. Like, I, I'm stuck. I'm not in a good situation. Life has gotten hard. I don't know what to do next. What I need more than anything else is help. Somebody, please help me. But what you feel in that moment is all alone because there is no help around. Anybody ever felt that before? Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are people here this morning who are feeling that today. You've come in here and you just feel stuck in life. Life feels hard. It feels overwhelming. You feel confused. You feel burdened. And what you need is some measure of help and you feel nothing but alone. If that's you this morning, I, I think our passage in John 16 is the perfect help for you. Now, the context of where we're at in John's gospel is we're in this section, chapter 13 through 17, and we're crossing into chapter 16, the back half of that section. But in this whole section, Jesus is in his last evening with his disciples. And the context of this section is a meal that Jesus is having with his disciples before he will go to the cross. And entering into this dinner, the disciples had no idea that it was their last night at, with Jesus. He springs this on them in the middle of the meal, and they are confused and distraught and grieved. And Jesus says, once he tells them he's leaving, where I'm going, you cannot come. And this starts to cause, this causes the disciples to start asking all sorts of questions, like, where are you going? Why can't we come? What does this mean for us? How are we going to navigate life without you? And if that's not bad enough for the disciples to comprehend and make sense of, also in this section, Jesus tells the disciples that things for them are going to get really hard. He says to them, don't be surprised if you experience persecution. Don't be surprised if you are hated because of your allegiance to me. Don't be surprised if you're dismissed and disregarded. Now, the reason he's telling them this is, one, so that they won't be surprised when those things happen, but also he's telling them this because, like he says in chapter 16, verse 1, all this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Jesus knows that for the disciples, when things get hard, they might be tempted to fall away and leave him behind. Jesus is saying here for the disciples that things are going to get hard. At the end of chapter 15, he has already told them that they should expect persecution, that they should expect being hated, because if the world hates Jesus, it also might hate them. And then he goes on to say, he adds to it this, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. He adds to the list of hard things, excommunication from the synagogue and murder. And the reason they're, they're going to do this, Jesus says in verse 3, is they will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when, the time, when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. Again, accentuating, I am leaving and leaving you behind. Now, again, if I'm a disciple, I'm starting to ask a whole other series of questions about this moment. Questions like, wait, 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 this is not what I signed up for. Like, this is not what I expected this. Do I still want to do this? Am I still in on Jesus? And also, if I'm a disciple, my emotions are all over the place. Jesus has just told us he's leaving, and now he's telling us we're going to be persecuted. I'm feeling like an emotional mess. And Jesus knows this. He says this in verse 5. Now, none of you asks me, where are you going? Now, that's not completely true, because if you were to back up to chapter 13, verse 36, Peter actually asked that very same question. He said, Jesus, 
Where are you going? And so scholars and commentators say here, when Jesus says, hey, you're not asking where I'm going, it's a way for them to accentuate that Jesus is recognizing their grief in this moment. It's less about them not asking a specific question, but it's probably they've gotten to the point where they're not asking any questions at this point. Even though they probably have them turning over in their head, they're just stunned and shocked and grieved. Because it says this in verse 6, rather, you are filled with grief. They are just so overcome with grief. It's like they've forgotten that Jesus has just told them he's leaving, and they're just sitting in the shock and the dismay of like, and now we're going to be persecuted and maybe even killed? What in the world is this? He says, rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things to you. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Let that sink in just for a moment. Jesus has just told the disciples that this is a good thing. I mean, he's leaving. He's going to a place where they cannot come. They cannot follow. And when he leaves, they will be hated, persecuted, excommunicated, and even murdered. And this is a good thing. Like, Jesus, can you please explain to me how that is a good thing? One of the challenges of raising kids, there are these moments when you can see that your kids are either not operating to their fullest potential, or they're starting to develop some habits that may not be great if they continue on in them. You can also see that there are some lessons that they need to learn the hard way by experiencing the difficulty of whatever they're going into. And your impulse is to rescue them, to save them. But you know the best thing for them is to step back. The best thing for them is to give them space. The best thing for them is to work this out and wrestle it through and, and know that they do have an ultimate safety net, but they need to figure this out on their own. Anybody who's raised kids? Recall moments like that with your kids? Yeah. When I was younger, I had a paper route. My brother and I shared this paper route. And the first time, the very first week of this paper route, um, it was so exciting, right? Like, we're making money. We're young kids. We got through Monday through Friday. We did it all on our own. The, the stack of papers would get delivered to our house. We had to pull them in. We were up at like 5 o'clock. I was like in fifth grade at the time. Up by 5 o'clock, we'd have to roll them, rubber band them, stuff them in these carrier bags that we had. And then we would walk or ride our bikes about a mile to another neighborhood, deliver them, try and get home by 6.30 so we could get to school. By the time we got to Saturday and Sunday, the papers stopped being thin and they were like starting to get bigger throughout the week. Sunday's papers, no joke, were like two inches thick. And we pulled them in, we realized there's no way that we can carry all of these. So it became this family affair. Like my dad pulled up his old Jeep, we loaded them in the back, we went to the neighborhood. We, like, my parents are wrapping one. My dad's driving. My mom's in the back. She's wrapping one. She's handing it to my brother or me, and then we're running to the house. It was really like this exciting family thing. Somewhere along the way, I think my brother and I began to think, this is going to be a family thing every day, not just on Sundays when the papers are huge. And so we started to like slack off. We started to sleep in. We started to not take it as seriously because mom and dad are there to help, right? And so my mom said one day, she's like, look, we'd been sleeping in a lot and not getting up when we needed to and resisting getting up. And my mom said, tomorrow, if you don't get up, this paper route thing is done. And guess what happened the next morning? We didn't get up and we had to quit the paper route because we stopped doing it. There are these moments when you're leading and guiding your kids happens with students, happens with people that you're training, where somewhere along the way you have to step back and let them feel the full weight of the responsibility. And Jesus has invited the disciples to be in relationship with him, and he has been there with them the whole time, but now he knows it's time for them to feel the full weight of this responsibility of what I've called them into. And for their good, I'm going to take a step back so that they can begin to flourish and thrive. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a walk in the park. But they are going to flourish and thrive 
without me. But Jesus is not abandoning them. He would never abandon them. He's creating space while at the same time being available to help them. So back to my van. I'm sitting in the cottage. I've just been told that the, the, the most recent tow, or the, the quickest tow that I can get is Monday. It's Saturday, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world am I going to do? I just happen to walk back out to the van to get some perspective, to see the situation. Like, can I push the van? I mean, do we just leave it here for two days, get somebody to pick us up and bring us home? As I walk back out to get perspective and assess the situation, there's this random guy with this monster truck at the end of the driveway, just assessing the thing, and he's like, looks like you're stuck. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. And he doesn't tell me he's going to help me. He doesn't say anything. He's like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to back my truck around, and we're going to get you out of here. And he just does it, and he hooks it up. This is from my rear view mirror in my rear view camera in my, my truck or my van. He just hooked it together somehow, said, Go put it in neutral and whoop, back me right up. You can see the, di- the, the treads that I left behind. Like, it was bad. I mean, I was pretty sure. Like, this was an angel in the flesh who had been sent by God. There was no one around. These were like all vacation homes. I think he's the one other guy who actually lives full time on that little strip. And he came to the rescue in a huge way. In the same way that it felt like in that moment this guy was sent from the Lord to help me. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I'm leaving. You're going to have to figure this out on your own, but I am still going to be with you because I'm sending someone to help you. He says this, continuing on in verse 7, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, this word advocate is the word that John, one of the words that John uses to talk about the Holy Spirit in his gospel. The Greek term for advocate here is the term parakaleto, and that's two words put together. It's a very versatile word because it's two words put together, and these two words coming together to make a new word create a very versatile word of what this word can mean. It's the word para, which is a preposition that means alongside, and then it's the word kaleto, which means to call out. So what the Holy Spirit does is he comes alongside and he calls out to you. So here, John translates that term, advocate. Other translations will translate that term, comforter. The Spirit comes alongside to call out to you, to comfort you. Other translations will use the word helper. The Spirit comes alongside to call out to you, specifically to help you. Jesus is sending an advocate, a comforter, somebody who can ultimately help. Now, in this section, John 13 through 17, Jesus promises the Spirit five times. There are five explicit promises of the Spirit. In our passage today, we have three of those five promises. If we were to back up to the end of chapter 15, 15 verse 26, it's the first promise in our passage, the third promise overall. Jesus says this. He says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying that the Spirit is your help when things get hard. The Spirit is your help when things get hard. And then he gives three specific ways that the Spirit can help you. And the first one we see is that the Spirit testifies. He says, when the Spirit comes, when the Advocate comes, when the Helper comes, he will testify about me. Now, when things get hard and you need help, it's really easy to doubt God's goodness in your life, isn't it? I'm hard. God has abandoned me. He's left me in the lurch. I don't understand what's going on. I don't know how to do this on my own. I need some help, and Jesus and God are nowhere to be found, right? But one of the things the Spirit does is it testifies, and we read in Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit 
that we are the children of God. Essentially, the Spirit resides within you. The Spirit is continually speaking to you. The Spirit is continually testifying and reminding you of who you are. You are God's children. And as children of God, he will give you everything you need. He will provide for you always. He is there for you always. Things might get hard. He might give a little leeway. He might make you feel the weight of whatever you're in, but he is always with you. He's for you. You are his children, and he will provide for you. The Spirit reminds us of God's goodness, provision, and that we are loved. But as we keep reading, it's not just the Spirit who testifies, but we read this in verse 27 of chapter 15. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The Spirit testifies to us. And then even when things get hard, we have a responsibility. There is weightiness to the ministry of Jesus And even when he's gone and the disciples are by themselves, they still have work to do, and the Spirit will testify and remind them of who they are even when it's hard. And then the disciples have the responsibility to testify to the world. Now, testimony is oftentimes an eyewitness account of something that you have seen or experienced, right? It's firsthand experience, and you tell other people what you have experienced. And what Jesus is saying is that we are called to give eyewitness testimony, firsthand accounts, stories of what God has been doing in our lives, of where God is at work, of how he is providing, of how he is helping, of how he is supporting. And so the question for us this morning is where have you seen God at work in your life? What is the story of how God has helped you? of how in real time he's helping you. Now, sometimes we have this perception that those stories are supposed to be these big, outrageous, amazing, supernatural moments where God just swoops in and does something unthinkable in my life. Sometimes those happen. But sometimes when looking for those, we lose sight of the everyday, subtle moments of the way God is giving you everything you need all the time. The fact that you're awake this morning, God has sustained your life through another night. The fact that you are able to take a deep breath is a gift from God. He has provided us with so many things. The fact that you have enough resources To not have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from is a gift from God. The fact that you live in a neighborhood with with neighbors who you have community with and you can send your kids to a school and you can have them play soccer and whatever other activities they do and you have all you need and more. All that is a good gift from God. The fact that you have this church in your life And you can walk with people and be supported in your spiritual journey is a good gift from God. Sometimes it's easy to focus on all these things we wish we had and we live in this place of like, God has done nothing for me. But when you take a simple account of all the simple ways that God has blessed you and the goodness that he has bestowed upon you and the simple everyday things, you're like, wow, I am abundantly blessed with all that I have and more. And we have that story to tell of how God has been good and what he has done in our life, a firsthand account of his goodness. And testimony is powerful. The stories of what God has done in your life, whether it's big or small, are wildly powerful. But what might come our way when we share those stories is pushback, ridicule, and resistance. So not only does the Spirit testify, but the Spirit also verifies specifically that the world has rejected God. This is verse 8. When he comes, he will provide, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, and about sin because people do not believe in me. Like, this has been John's point of his whole story since the beginning. You go back to chapter 1, verse 10. He says, he, being Jesus, 
was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Jesus creates this amazing, beautiful, good world. He comes into the world to rescue it. People do not recognize him. People reject him. It's the point of John's gospel that Jesus comes to save the world, but the world rejects him. And as his followers, they might even reject and ridicule us as well. He goes on to say that the spirit will prove the world to be uh, condemned for sin, but also for righteousness. He says about righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, which is kind of hard to understand. Like, what it, like how, how does that prove to the world that they are in the wrong about righteousness? Well, one scholar and commentator said, it's the idea that when Jesus leaves, like, he is the righteousness of God. And when he leaves, righteousness on this earth is nowhere to be found. Because if we are honest with ourselves, our own righteousness is bankrupt. Like we don't have the ability to manufacture righteousness on our own. So everybody is looking for some measure of righteousness that they can compare themselves to so they feel righteous, but there is no true righteousness. There is no true justice apart from Jesus. And Jesus is saying, as I leave, the standard for righteousness and justice in this world also leaves and you are called to live amongst the world, to communicate to the world about my righteousness, my justice, and my love. It says in Isaiah 64, 6, that even our best of deeds is like filthy rags in comparison to the righteousness of God. John three nineteen says, the verdict is this, light has come into the world. But men love darkness because their deeds are evil. The Spirit convicts the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment, he says. He says, verse 11, and about judgment because the prince of this world is now condemned. Evil in this world has been condemned but yet evil still continues on. So the question is, if that's what the Spirit is going to do, he's going to prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment, how is he going to do that? It's the same thing with testimony. The, The Spirit testifies to us so that we can testify to the world. One of the ways that the Spirit is going to verify for the world that the world has rejected God is through us. Now, some people translate that and think that means we have to go around and call the world out, condemn the world, stand with a bullhorn on a corner and yell at everybody as they pass by. You're wrong! You're a dirty, rotten sinner, and you're going to hell! Right? We've all encountered people who do that and believe that. But notice what Jesus does. Notice how Jesus lives his life. The way that Jesus condemns evil in the world is by dying at the hand of of evil and injustice. And by doing so, he disarms the powers and authorities of both the present earthly realm and spiritual realm. That's what Colossians 2.15 says. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, not through a victorious military campaign, but by the death, by his death on the cross. See, when you serve somebody who is hostile to you, it instantly pronounces a judgment on them that they cannot refute. It disarms their ability to say, I'm in the right and you're wrong. When you serve somebody who is hostile to you, it completely condemns them. And you don't even have to say a word. There's a story from uh, Withville, Virginia, from uh, years ago of these Two people, Tony and Ricky, um, who were in their home one day, Tony and Ricky Sexton, who were held hostage in their own home by two other individuals, uh, Dennis and Angela, who were out on a crime spree. They were running from the law, a three-day crime spree. Uh, Ricky was out walking her dog, and they like came speeding into her driveway, held her up at gunpoint, get back in the house, and they held them hostage. 
Eventually, the police found where they were, and a standoff ensued. And Tony and Ricky did something unimaginable during those nine hours that they were held hostage in their own home by these two people who were on a three-day crime spree. They decided to use this moment to demonstrate the love of Jesus to them. They listened to their captors' troubles. They fed them and served them warm, home-cooked food. They prayed with them and sought to demonstrate the love of Jesus. Eventually, when it was like, notice that, okay, this isn't going to end well for them. Ricky, the husband of this couple, was even hesitant to go out and and go out into safety because one of his captors said the way that he was going to end this situation was by committing suicide, and Ricky decided to stay with him to convince him not to do that. Eventually, the police were able to call the uh, the, the, the two perpetrators out of the home, and what was left behind was a note by one of the perpetrators that read, thank you for your hospitality, we really appreciate it. She left $130 because it was all they had, and she said, we wish you all the best of luck and love. And they were saved. When you serve those who are hostile to you, it disarms their power. It disarms their ability to not be condemned by the evil that they are doing. And so the the Spirit testifies, the Spirit verifies, and the Spirit also edifies. The Spirit builds up, equips us, and trains us to live in that way. Verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Two things that are said here of what the Spirit will do. The Spirit will guide you into all truth, which we might think is what the the, the content, the truth of what Jesus teaches. It's part of that, but it's a whole lot more than that. It's the wisdom that we need to navigate a world that might be against us. it's It's a wisdom that we need to understand how we navigate a situation where we need help and it feels like, I don't know what to do. We can trust that the Spirit is within us, guiding us moment by moment, step by step, day by day. And it says that He will tell you of what's to come. The disciples had no idea of what's to come. They had no idea before the start of that night that Jesus was going to leave them, that they were going to be under a whole lot of trouble in the days ahead. And Jesus is trying to foreshadow there's something better coming. It is going to be hard, but there is a day when all things will be made right. And we live knowing the end of the story. The disciples didn't know what was yet to come, but we do. And what we know is that even when things get hard, we have the helper with us. Even when things are hard and the world is hostile against us, we have the power of the Spirit to continue to love and serve the world, even when that seems foolish, because we know one day Jesus will return to make all things new. The resurrection from the dead is a deposit. It's a promise of what Jesus will do when he comes back to make all things new. So if you're in a place where you're like, I'm stuck, I'm in over my head, I need help, and no one is around, Jesus is saying the Spirit is your help when things get hard. Whether that's because you're experiencing hostility from the world, or you're just stuck in a rut and you have no, what, you have no idea of what to do. The Spirit is is your help when things get hard, which means you have three responses to that reality. And the first is to listen, to trust that the Spirit is within you, continually testifying to you of who God is, who you are in light of who God is, and what he has done for you, and the promise of what he will do. Two, you have the responsibility to speak, to share that with other people, when it makes sense to speak and testify about who God is and what he has done in your life. And then you have the responsibility to stay the course, to persevere, to not give up, to lean in, to know that you are not alone. And so one of the things that we do at the end of every service is we say that we will have members of our prayer team up front to pray for people. And maybe you walked in this morning and you're like, I'm in a world of trouble. And I need more help than I could ever imagine. I have no idea where to go. Well, you're in the right place. Because you have people, strangers, who you don't even know, who are going to be here to help you, to remind you of the Spirit's work in your life, 
to remind you that the Spirit is with you and for you, and to pray that God will give you wisdom and discernment. And we believe that prayer is powerful, and that when God's people submit themselves to him in prayer, things happen. And so if that is you this morning, the invitation is wide open to come up front and receive prayer for whatever it is that's weighing you down, and to know that the Spirit is your help when things get hard. So, it's, so listen to the Spirit. Speak when he prompts you to speak, and stay the course even when it feels like you can't go on. So may you trust that the Holy Spirit is with you. May you have the courage to testify to what God has done for you, and may you stay the course knowing what is yet to come. Lord, we thank you so much for this reminder of how the Spirit is continually at work in our lives. We ask, Lord, that for those who are here this morning, who are feeling weighed down by the burdens of this world, who are feeling stuck in a rut and don't know how to move forward, don't know how to get going, don't know how to move from one day to the next, that they would be able to see that the Helper has come, that the Helper is here, that they have access to you and all that you offer to be their help to be their comforter, to be their advocate. And so, Lord, this morning, we ask for those who are in need that you would remind them of who you are, remind them of who they are, that they are your children, and that you would remind them of what they have done, what you have done for them, and you would give them a sense of hope that you are not done yet. Amen.